Well, good evening. Welcome to Space Oddities. How is everybody? You're all very welcome. If this is your first time here, you are more than welcome. And uh, we hope you'll stay with us. If you don't know what Space Oddities is all about, well, the previous video probably explained it a little bit, but we are sort of the blue Peter of astronomy and space exploration. I'm Valerie Singleton. So uh, you're more than welcome. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, God, you've let yourself go. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it really happens with age. Anyway, joining us from Shropshire uh, with the headphones on, we've got Mr. John Noakes. How are you, John? <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Lovely. Get down, Shep. Get down. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Oh, uh, some uh, people won't know what we're talking about. No, 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 no. So yeah, um, no, everything's fine. We've had uh, atrocious weather here for uh, uh, the last three or four days, um, which is <laughs> norm um, <laughs> being on the Welsh borders. So uh, yeah, it's it's not not been good for um, viewing or trying to get out and get any uh, imaging done. Uh, no. with the sea star or any of the other telescopes so it's uh yeah. well, it's so a sad what, state of affairs here i'm afraid what's your temperature been like um i'm, I'm quite well oh well. good glad to hear um, no, <laughs> no it's, it's well the temperature's dropping now because we're getting we're expecting snow in the next couple of days that's pretty really? good great yeah. Yeah, really not, nothing cool. like Lou's had or anything like that no you no. know we'll have we'll have a boat sort of like what two or three atoms thick covering mm. and everything will come to a standstill trains planes and automobiles so yeah. you know what it's like here yeah i mean over here in, in catalonia um well i hate to mention it really but i will uh we, we've had uh, 24 degrees in the sunshine um for about yeah, the and you're all in coats what's that all about yeah i know i know and uh i've been out in a t-shirt in february which is unheard of uh but we do have an official drought here the water situation is getting quite desperate so, mm. um, so they're, they're bringing in tanker loads of water into Barcelona to to keep Barcelona mm. wet, as it were. Um, yeah. But uh, but up here uh, towards France, um, we don't know what we're going to do. So uh, we're probably going to go into rationing. So I don't know. Well, oh, good job you're in the water town, then, aren't you? The water yeah, capital. Yeah, that's right. There's plenty yeah. of water. Yeah, no messing, no messing. Yeah. So anyway, welcome, Roger. How are you, Roger? Down there in Deepwood. Oh. Oh, cloudy Sparkford, I'm afraid, as oh, is the norm again, I'm afraid, but uh, everything else is okay. Good, glad to hear it. Michael, mm. how's the hand? Hand is, st hand is still with us. Still yeah. with <laughs> you, you will be stuck with a permanent thumbs up after that cast yeah. comes off. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but you're, you're not in any pain, I hope, Michael. No, 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 no it's oh, fine. Okay. Well, we have two transatlantic video uh, visitors tonight. Uh, we have uh, our dear friend Lou, uh, all over there in the States. How are things over there, Lou? Is the snow gone? Oh, snow's gone. I was trying to think how I would tell you how cold it is. And uh, since we use different scales, I'll have to use Kelvin. It's about uh, 270 Kelvin. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Something all like right. That. Um, what, what is it in Fahrenheit? uh well it's uh, about it depends 20 uh high, high teens mid 20s right oh right. So, so, so below so freezing cool. yeah yeah below oh, freezing. all right okay yeah. and uh i uh i i didn't want to buy a sea star myself so i asked my department my uh at marymount to buy one so they bought one so i have one to play with oh, oh, yeah. yay. <laughs> yay that was crap that's the way to do it though <laughs> yeah that's yeah. how I can assure that when I send in images that Roger will put them up. I'll just put C star. Yeah. C -star. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think Space Oddities should invest in a Space Oddities C star. And uh, the obvious place for it with, with the best clear skies is, is here, of course. So um, <laughs> <laughs> You can do a product review, wouldn't that be good? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, Andy, you wouldn't have time to use it, mate. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's actually quite true. But uh, but uh, Daz, if you want to, you know, put together a, a product review for us at the Sea Star because everybody's talking about it, everybody's using it. Yeah. So, um, so well, ho ho hopefully, Kath's going to be on in the next couple of weeks, and she's uh, really yeah. catching on well with it. And she just, oh, she's, yes, she's, written, she's written an article, hasn't she? She's it? written an article. So yeah, what I'll probably do is um, when I've got some clear skies, I'm not going to do it when it's chucking it down with rain. Um, is I'll go out and I'll just run through how easy it is to set up. Yeah, that would be um, great. And then show people if we can get some images through. So, because yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. of course it can be used during the daytime for solar. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Solar as well. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Super. Right. So I would like to introduce everybody's very special guest this evening. Last but not least, he's, he's only last because he's sort of bottom right corner from where I am. Uh, so <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Robin Edgar. Robin's going to talk to us tonight. Robin has uh, spent a couple of decades, isn't it, Robin, researching uh, the influence of eclipses on three decades. My goodness me. Um, Robin's been researching the influence of eclipses on, on ancient cultures. So that's a very interesting topic, and he's going to talk to us about it tonight. How are you, Robin? Um, I'm, I'm basically okay. It was very problematic getting into the show. I don't know what happened, but... Well, it's technology. Here. It's technology. I, 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 I see the presentations thing in front of me. Mm. I see it's uploaded, so I guess all I have to do is click on it when it comes time to present. So. Right. I don't see the presentation. Does anybody see the presentation? No. Let me just have a look. No. 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 Um, oh, maybe... Well, that's strange, because I, I see it. And it's, right. it if, says if you present. Click on... I haven't clicked on present yet because I, I, I think ah. I only do that when it's time to present. Right. Uh, right. So what you do, you, you click on present now. Okay. And then it will appear underneath your thumbnail on the left-hand side of the screen. There it is. Yeah, I see it. There it is. That's ready to go now. Okay. Fine. Okay. <laughs> we sorted. I knew we'd get there. Jobs are good. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you've had some technical problems, but... Um, you know, uh, you know what it's like with different browsers and they do different things. And, mm. you know, so well, we, we do recommend Chrome because that seems to work for everybody. Uh, so there we are. Anyway, enough technical talk. Uh, what else have we got on the show tonight? Well, I think the best thing to do uh, before we start with the content is to say a big thank you to all of you who've been buying us coffees, keeping the uh, the wheels of industry here at Space Oddity is churning over, as it were. So thank you to everybody for your generosity. Mm. As always, it's much appreciated. Also, don't forget, uh, just to give it another quick plug, that the Space Oddities merchandise is now uh, uh, still available. You've got the, uh, the Space Oddities T-shirt, 10 colors available. That uh, is for the remarkable price of £20, including UK postage and packing. So it's a really good price because you know how expensive things are to, to post these days. And uh, you can scan the QR code here if you'd like to buy one. Full details are in the description of the video. We've also got the Space Oddities hoodies. They come in two types, an over-the-head hoodie with the design on the front um, and a zipper hoodie with the design on the back. They're available in six colors, and they are £40, again, including UK postage and packing. And, of course, if, as ever, if you would like to support Space Oddities, you can buy us a coffee by scanning the QR code and all of the money that you give us in coffees goes towards um, helping to keep the channel running and paying the bills that, you know, every YouTube channel has to has to pay. So, uh, you know, um, we are much appreciative of 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 your support so that we can we can keep going. I just want to have a quick look in the chat. Who's in tonight? There's some uh, usual the usual suspects are in tonight. I see Derek's in. Hi, Derek. Uh, Steve's in. I hope you're well, Steve. Uh, Stuart's in. Um, who else have we got down there? Kev's in. Graham's in. So we've got a, a nice crowd tonight. Hope you're all well. And uh, we will get straight on now with uh, with the time-honored tradition of going to Roger, who's going to tell us all about the night sky this month. Take it um, away, just Roger. To, Sorry, just before we start, because um, we, we were talking about sea stars, uh, in the chat, uh, Gerard uh, McIntyre, Metagart, uh, said, I would recommend a sea star. They are a brilliant idea for outreach. Mm. And then Daydream Astra, um, of course, which is our Rachel. So uh, we Rachel. used our sea star for the first time with our scout group on Tuesday. And their faces, of course, we used the use telescopes for visual observing oh, too. Yeah. And yeah. even our naked eye. But wow, so simple. Yeah. So absolutely. yeah, there's a good recommendation. Right. Where are you looking for this, Dallas? Do you have your monitors mounted on the ceiling? Or what's... Uh, there is, there is that. It's, it's, the thing is, this one is lower than it should be. That one's not so high. But, of course, you're looking straight up my nostrils, I'm afraid. So I'm sorry about that. Are, are you the Dennis Waterman of astronomy? Really tiny. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. Uh, yes, well, thank you for that, Gerard and, and Rachel. Um, you know, this, this wonder telescope is getting great reviews. 
And um, I think it was Kath who said there's been a, a firmware update recently, which has given it even more features. That's right. So yeah. I don't know whether you've received that yet, Daz, but there is a firmware. No, I haven't seen anything yet. I'll have a look for that. So, uh, so, so, yeah. Um, so, so there we are. Anyway, Roger, what's up? Hello. Hi. Right. Well, the usual suspects, as you say yourself. So here we are getting onwards towards the middle of February. And uh, through the end of the week, we've got a new moon, which will be helpful for any astrophotography persons, providing they've got some clear skies and not skies full of snow. So uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, this was my last picture of the moon that I took on the 1st of February, which uh, wasn't too bad. Oh, and nice. yes. So onwards as of 10 o'clock through this week, this is how we would look southwards in the night sky. Clear clouds and all that yeah. on the go. So uh, in the southwest, we've still got Jupiter uh, quite well placed. And uh, Orion now past the path at Zenith to uh, face, face the uh, southern skies and we've got leo and virgo coming up through for galaxy season in the spring yeah great so there we go so uh not too bad i mean we've still got uh, some opportunities to look at our lovely favorite constellation and there will be a uh um uh, the usual count of stars but i think they've stopped doing it this year yeah i've uh, seen for the, about for, it yeah for, no, I think they've cancelled it this year. To uh, yeah, they? Why? Because of the weather? Well, not. No, I think it's all cost again. I don't know. Uh, but uh, just before sunrise, and if you've got a very good low horizon, uh, tomorrow morning there's a very thin crescent moon just coming up with Venus, and uh, shortly afterwards is Mars. But uh, hmm. that could be rather... Uh, hard thing to see because uh, the glare from the uh, sunrise will probably blot out the uh, rather faint Mars unfortunately but uh, on about the 22nd Venus and Mars will be quite close together so uh, that might be a good opportunity but uh, Comet Pons Brooks is still uh, still with us it's now gone into Lacerta from from uh, Cygnus and uh, it's still gaining brightness. Yeah. Uh, it's It will peak uh, yeah. in the early part of April. So uh, good luck to anyone oh, who is, can that see that. Significantly brighter, isn't it? That's fantastic. Yes. It, 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 sh it should, in theory, be uh, naked eye quite easily. But uh, Yeah, that's the one I want we to can get. You can never really believe anything that they forecast. No, no, indeed. But uh, in, the, in the next week, we've got uh, Kushida, which yeah. unfortunately is a lot fainter, but it will be a good photo opportunity around the 11th mm -hmm. to uh, catch that. So that'll be next Sunday. Yeah, where that's, it will no, be that's another one. I'm photo bombing about. Aldebaran. Yeah, Aldebaran. Yeah, and as you can see, it's... Uh, getting marginally fainter but you know it's still it's still yeah. good for uh, those people who've got a sea star yeah. of course it's catchable right now we're going to go to the gallery of one <laughs> only one image this week from jerry and uh, he's got the flaming and tadpole nebula oh great and, oh and wow is, whoa yeah mm -hmm. so oh, there we go good. Good. that's, that's amazing jerry that's good cool. yeah. Good, good capture there. Mm. Yeah. Excellent capture, as always, Jerry. Yeah, and mm. it's a shame we're starting a competition for the best picture of the week uh, next week. Because uh, <laughs> you would have won it. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> um, Roger, yeah. have you not included any of your images this week? Uh, I thought I'd uh, spare you the uh, embarrassment of my pictures. Yeah, well, that's very con considerate of you. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and that's all I have because I haven't seen any updates from... Oh, hang on. He's gone. He's back. Okay, well, thank you for that. Don't forget, uh, viewers, if you would like to include your picture in the gallery, mail it to spaceoddlieslive at gmail.com. One image per email, please. And if you could entitle it something like gallery entry so we can find it in the in the inbox, that would be much appreciated. 
we do like looking at your images. And as we've said before, it doesn't have to be a sort of a deep sky image or a planetary image if you've just got some nice nightscapes um, or dayscapes involving the sun or anything involving astronomical objects. We'd love to see them because we do love uh, looking at them. And, uh, you know, as we've often said, the, the quality of the images that we receive from you is absolutely stunning. And just a few years ago, you could have only done those sort of images with real professional huge telescopes mm -hmm. so uh, you know uh, and now the sea star is on the market which we've mentioned for about the 50th time tonight uh, we're not we're not <laughs> being sponsored by sea star believe it or not uh, you know that this is another imaging revolution and uh, these telescopes are only going to get more intelligent and cheaper and uh, more capable as as time goes on as the march of technology moves relentlessly on Okay, um, I haven't had time to uh, put the news together this week, unfortunately. I've been busy with uh, work and lots of things. But, uh, guys, has anybody seen any major news stories that they want to briefly talk about? Um, there were several, but give us uh, five minutes. <laughs> Why do you be able to knock something up? <laughs> okay, well, um, I'll tell you what, let's, let's, yeah. let's, uh, let's introduce uh, Robin's presentation. Yeah. Perhaps we can talk about it afterwards. So if you've got anything to, to add. Um, the only one I saw, just to mention one very briefly, was the ongoing court case against the uh, local council in Boca Chica in Texas, uh, who are, um, there are environmental and native Indian groups suing Brownsville Council for allowing SpaceX to close the beach when they're doing rocket testing and launching at Boca Chica. That case will appear in the courts, I should think, you know, several months hence. So it's not going to affect SpaceX's next orbital launch attempt, which is scheduled for sometime this month. We don't have an exact date. But again, if we can uh, cover it live, uh, depending on when it happens, we will cover the, uh, the, the third attempt of the SpaceX Starship to get into orbit. And uh, I don't know, I think they'll nail it this time. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, so I'd like to reintroduce uh, Mr. Robin Edgar, who's going to talk to us about the influence of eclipses on ancient cultures. Are you ready, Robin? I think so. Do I, I just click on the little arrow here? Well, I will. Uh, all, all I do, um, I'll add it into the stream like this and just use the arrow to move through the slides. And that's it. There you go. Right, so, so I use the arrow? Okay. So here we go. Mm. Um, so this is the title page. Um Eclipses, especially total solar eclipses, have had a much greater influence on ancient humanity's religious, religious beliefs and iconography than is generally understood. Cultural eclipsology, that's a term I came up with, is a subset of cultural astronomy that researches this influence on culture. The background photo is a astronomical drawing of the 1878 uh, total solar eclipse by one Etienne Leopold Trouvelot. And you'll notice the polar plumes above and below the sun. And you'll notice the wing-like uh, streamers on either side of it. Uh, so let's move ahead here. Okay. So this is a composite photo of the 2001 total solar eclipse by Wendy Carlos. Uh, you might have heard of Wendy Carlos. So who? That's not uh, the Wendy Carlos, is it? It is the Wendy Carlos. Really? I, did, I didn't know. The, the, the former was. Walter Carlos? Yeah, former yes, Walter Carlos. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Ah. Switched on, on back. The, yeah. On the, she, she, she basically does uh, composite photos from other people's negatives, maybe sometimes her own. But you'll see here Jonathan Kern. Jonathan Kern was a photographer. He took a bunch of photos with a special filter. And then they were blended together by by Wendy Carlos, to, you know, to give something that is very close to what can be seen with the unaided human eye during totality. So you see the black disc of the moon surrounded by the corona in a lot of detail. Well, a little bit of a protuberance there. On the right, you have a photograph of one of the petroglyphs that's carved into a curbstone of the Neolithic Irish passage to Douth. Um, and the caption says, either the sun or an eye may be signified in this carving in a curbstone of a retaining wall that was built to protect the base of a burial mound at Douth, County Meath, Ireland. In my early researches, when I came across this, 
in a Time Life book called The Monument Builders, um, I immediately recognized that this was a false dichotomy. Uh, that, in fact, what this is, as far as I'm concerned anyway, is a quite accurate depiction of a total solar eclipse with the dark uh, central... Whoops, a daisy. <laughs> what happened there? Um, in any case, uh, the eclipse does does look like an eye. Um, this is a uh, quotation from the late Jack B. Zerker, Zerker, Astronomer Emeritus at Sacramento Peak National Sol Observatory, describing the 1980 total, total solar eclipse. Um, I look up. Incredible. It is the eye of God, a perfectly black disc ringed with bright, spiky streamers that stretch out in all directions. Um, so the way I see it is if a university-educated professional astronomer can look up and see the similarity of a total solar eclipse to the pupil and iris of an eye staring down from the sky, I'm pretty sure Neolithic people and even earlier people could do that. Um, let's move ahead here. This is a bird-like pattern that's perceivable in the sun's corona during some total solar eclipses. Uh, this is a composite photo of the July 11th, 1991 total solar eclipse by Miloslav Druckmuller. Um, I noticed this bird-like pattern first, and also the eye pattern, in a photograph of the same total solar eclipse that was published in the May 1992 issue of National Geographic magazine. Um, it was taken by Serge Kuchmi, a French astronomer. I, I think I already maybe said that. Um, and I immediately saw the similarity to the eye because the page was orientated 90 degrees the other way on the page. It was only a few weeks later when I saw the same photo from a 90 degree angle edge on where I noticed the bird-like pattern. Uh, and when I saw that bird-like pattern, my immediate thought was, this is probably the original source of inspiration for the Phoenix myth. If you compare the basics of the Phoenix myth to what happens in a total solar eclipse, there's a lot of parallels. There's only one Phoenix. It appears every few hundred years. It dies and reborn on the same day. Those three elements of the Phoenix myth are identical to what happens in a total solar eclipse, other than we're looking at an average. That 350-year average is just that. It's an average. You can actually have total solar eclipses happening in relatively rapid succession over the same area, uh, as is happening in the United States very soon. I'll just go ahead here. So this is a drawing of, it's basically the, the, the what we saw earlier, the Truvalo drawing of the corona. Uh, and uh, it this is from an article written by the British astronomer Edward Walter Maunder, an old record of the corona, which was published in Knowledge magazine in 1897. Uh, while I was researching early on, uh, I came across a reference to this article uh, while I was looking at a book on uh, what they call the migration of sy symbols in McGill University Library. Um, and I thought, I wonder if they have that article here in the library because they had a lot of old books and magazines. And sure enough, they did. Um, so what happened is uh, Edward Walter Maunder, going back actually to the early 1880s, and I think it was largely as a result of seeing this drawing by Truvalo, but also others, he noticed the wings on either side, the bird-like pattern, and he hypothesized that this is what inspired the winged sun symbols. Initially, he spoke about Assyria, uh, and then he later uh, you know, noticed uh, that the uh, Egyptians had a, a, a slightly different winged sun symbol. The Assyrian and Mesopotamian ones are quite interesting because they show the polar plumes. The polar plumes are represented as the tail of a bird or sometimes just as the, the plume. So this is the uh, Truvalo drawing, uh, undisturbed by any text over it. So you can see the polar plumes. And if you, if you take that all the way around the sun, if you continue that pattern all the way around the sun, well, then you have the eye pattern. And then you have the thickly condensed... Uh, equatorial streamers that are the wings. Uh, and this is also where the winged eye concept comes from. This is the Assyrian 
uh, version of the winged sun symbol. You have the uh, supreme Assyrian deity Asher inside a, looks like a rayed sun. And then you'll notice how the wings, they're, they're not like a bird's wings, really. They're, they're like rays coming out on either side. You clearly see the bird tail, which is also a kilt, as it were, for Asher. Um, and then on top of that, you'll see the sort of horn-like uh, pattern, which I won't get into right now because we're doing an overview here. But but clearly, you can see the... I'll just go back. One, two. I think you can see the similarity there. So let's keep going because we got 47 slides to get through. <laughs> okay, this is more from... Uh, uh, Edward Walter Maunder's uh, article. It's called An Old Record of the Corona. If you look for it in Google Books, you'll find it. I've also reproduced the full text on my Cultural Eclipsology blog, so it's all there. You can go read it. Um, and here he speaks of a symbol, which is a representation of the corona of minimum. That's taken from that article. I'll just continue along here because we have a lot of slides to get through. Uh, this is an illustration. You know, somebody imagining ancient Egyptians seeing the winged uh, sun pattern a corona and looking up at it in awe and, and even worship as you can see the the woman uh, in the the middle there sort of in praise I don't actually know who did this I came across it and I, I I unfortunately can't credit the artist but clearly they're illustrating this concept here of the ancient Egyptians seeing this winged uh, sun in the sky. Let's continue along. Okay, here we have three different versions of the Egyptian wing sun symbol. And here you'll see it's more like a bird's wing. At the top, you have the standard winged sun symbol with a serpent on either side. And in fact, the serpents are crisscrossing each other. And I believe the two serpents represent the path of the sun and the path of the moon in the sky. Uh, you know, when you're tracking the path of the sun and moon in the sky, particularly the path of the moon above and below the ecliptic, you get a sine wave-like pattern. Um, and, and so I think this uh, inspired the uh, concept, or partly inspired the concept of the sun-eating eclipse serpent, uh, which in the Egyptian mythology was Apep or Apop. Below it, you have a winged scarab, and I do believe, based on my researches, that even the scarab god Kepri uh, was inspired by not just the sun itself, uh, but by total solar eclipses. There's two reasons. One is that if you go back to that photo of the um, corona evenly distributed in the black circle, it's very comparable to a top view of a black scarab beetle uh, with the wings out. Um, but also, it's a hole in the sky. And the myth of Kepri is that Kepri pushes a dung ball representing the sun into a hole, buries it, and then later the larvae are, are reborn. So it's all about death and rebirth. And I, I believe, this is my interpretation of the myth, that when Kepri pushes the dung ball of the sun into the hole and buries it, that is the as above, so below equivalent of the total solar eclipse. And then later when the larvae are reborn, that's the sun being reborn after the eclipse. Uh, below that, you have a, a vulture. Uh, and basically the wing sun symbols are, are they're basically interpreted as vulture wings. And you'll see the vulture wearing what's called the white crown. It's not very obvious there. And I believe the white crown is inspired by those wing-like streamers. Um, so as I said, I... I in my research has made this connection with the uh, phoenix and, and researching that I, I basically found a whole flock of other mythical birds and bird gods uh notably the solar falcon god horus uh who is even described as flying up to the sun in the form of a winged disc in some versions of the horus myth um and what happened is you know the, i i saw this photo taken by serge kuchmi in the may 1992 national geographic sometime later some years later um, I published to the internet in the late 1990s. Um, and, and I published, you know, my rediscovery as it were of Edward Walter Maunder's, uh, uh, wing sun hypothesis, but also what I had found in terms of the Phoenix and, and other mythical birds. And clearly without me contacting him directly, Serge Kuchmi 
came across my research. He probably Googled his name one day and, and this came up and he included it in a PowerPoint uh, presentation that he made in 2006. Uh, so symbols in Assyria, image of the Corona, and he, he used the term American Phoenix. This is actually at the, at the bottom. It's a bird from Teotihuacan, Mexico. And you'll see that it, the, it's a, it's a Quetzal bird, but it has essentially the same as a wing sun symbol on its, uh, chest. Um, so the words of Serge Kuchmi, uh, the symbol of the obscured and winged sun is found in many vestiges of famous civilizations. Perhaps this is indeed the solar corona with its large streamers, its prominences and polar plumes observed at total solar eclipses, question mark. I'm a bit more affirmative about that. Um, but, but he did reference my online research in that. Um, the winged eye. This is from the uh, Stanford Solar, Cent uh, Solar Center. Stanford University, they came across my research and they mentioned it on their website. Um, and this photo here uh, of the winged eye symbol, Egyptian one, I actually took that one myself. This is from a mummy in the British Museum. Um, I went to see the 1999 total solar eclipse in England. And while I was there, I went to the British Museum and got a lot of uh, photos of mummies and, and including this uh, winged eye symbol. We'll continue along here. Okay, um, one of the perceptions of an eclipse is a great big smile in the sky um, because when it gets to this narrow crescent, uh, it does indeed look like a smile. Uh, and, and so you have the, um, the uh, parallel between the mouth and the eclipse. I mean, you also have the parallel in terms of the sun in quotation marks being eaten. Um, but nevertheless, I just found it quite interesting that these NASA commentators describing the total solar eclipse in Australia uh, in April last year, I think it was April 20th, says, now it looks like a great big smile. That's a great big smile. And we'll continue along. Uh, here we go. So here we have a great big smile in the sky that's big enough to swallow a 747. Um, I can't credit the photographer. I don't know who, but but we're talking something that's very large in terms of you know angular diameter. Um, and we'll continue along because we have a lot of slides to get through. So here we have the winged serpent. Uh, this is Apep. This is the Egyptian version of the winged serpent. Uh, and and so I'll, I'll just read the text. Uh, the myth that solar eclipses are caused by a serpent eating the sun is quite common. It arises out of the fact that serpents slowly swallow their prey whole, and some snakes even eat eggs, which are not analogous to the sun. Also, when one tracks the path of the moon in the sky, it traces a sine wave-like serpentine pattern above and below the ecliptic. When you attach the wings seen in the sun's corona during some total solar eclipses to the sun-eating eclipse serpent, you get a winged serpent. I might add you also get a plume serpent. Um, the dragon is an embellished version of the winged sun-eating e eclipse serpent. And I should add that ja uh, Chinese dragons don't have wings. Below the, uh, the egg-eating serpent here, you have uh, the Great Serpent Mound in Ohio. This is a very large geoglyph. I think it's about a thousand feet long or something. Um, and it clearly depicts a snake. And there's no question about that. Uh, and the snake appears to be eating, swallowing uh, an oval, uh, which has a, a dot in the middle. And I, I think this is, is basically a, a gigantic depiction of the sun-eating eclipse serpent, uh, as imagined by the uh, indigenous people of uh, North America. I think around 1000 BC, this dates back to. Um, so they, they made, made that. It's a very simple, straightforward, as above, so below connection that, that various different cultures made. Over on the right, you have a black and white drawing of a total solar eclipse. And you'll see how the way that the, the so-called helmet streamers of the sun's corona uh, look like the fangs of, uh, of a snake. So that's another possible perception there that, that they might have even seen some of the white um, uh, uh, cones, as it were, 
they might have thought of that as fangs of a snake eating the sun. And then below that, you have a Mexican Aztec uh, Quetzalcoatl figure, I believe. I know Quetzalcoatl is associated with Venus, but I think he may have been misidentified because his Venus is the heart of Quetzalcoatl, as I understand it. I, I personally believe that Quetzalcoatl is a total solar eclipse god, uh, basically a version of the sun-eating eclipse serpent or, or based around that. Uh, continuing on here. Here we have the Chinese dragon. You'll notice it doesn't have wings. Uh, this is very, very well known. Uh, on the left, we have a page from the Expl Exploratorium. Uh, it says, a recurring and uh, pervasive embodiment of the eclipse was a dragon or a demon who devours the sun. The ancient Chinese would produce great noise and commotion during an eclipse, banging on pots and drums uh, to frighten away the dragon. And then over here, uh, the ancient Chinese believe that solar eclipses occur when a celestial dragon devours the sun. They also believe that this dragon attacks the moon during lunar eclipses. In the Chinese language, the term for eclipse was Qi, which also means to eat. This is a NASA source, and I've given the URL below. The image above in the yellow that's a flag of the uh kin uh, dynasty that's a not it's a 19th century chinese dynasty flag showing the sun eating eclipse dragon um here we have um image showing the prominences the red prominences that are seen during totality and i will read uh, these are called solar prominences, tongues of hot hydrogen gas rising from the lowest layer of the sun's atmosphere called the chromosphere. Joe Rao, space.com columnist. And then also you have, there may be tongues of red fire visible around the edge of the sun. These are solar prominences. This is eclipse2024.org. Um, the photo is by one Tom Bartle. Uh, so you have that word tongues, and that word has been used going back to the 19th century. I've seen in my research as 19th century astronomers using that term, uh, which brings us to this. Uh, this is the center of the Aztec calendar, um, and you have the tongue sticking out, and a recent new interpretation of the Aztec sunstone, which corresponds with my research is that it actually represents the total eclipse sun um and so you have the tongue and then you have the tongue with gorgons uh greek gorgons and so on um so let's continue along this is best this is a egyptian uh, god you'll see the plumed uh, headdress uh, which i have every reason to believe is inspired by the polar plumes of a total solar eclipse and you'll see he's sticking his tongue out and you'll also notice on the right his navel is a red disc which i have every reason to believe is a red solar disc and it's got everything to do with the rebirth of the sun after totality in a total solar eclipse okay on the left this is from a nazca pottery and on the right you have a mayan uh, warrior and you'll see the mayan warrior's shield is essentially an anthropomorphized version of the sun. Remember, you have the, the eye similarity, you have the mouth similarity, um, and then you have the corona you know, all around the sun during totality. You'll also notice his collar. If you look down a top view of that collar, it's the same thing. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is total solar eclipse imagery in Aztec uh, and Mayan uh, sorry, uh, well, they have it in mind too, but Nazca culture as well. Uh, let's continue along here. Okay, here we have a NASA map of uh, eclipses for 2021 to 2040. And I am showing this because this sort of shows how that myth about total solar eclipses occurring on average every 350 years is a bit of a misleading myth because people think they're very, very rare over any one area. But in fact, you can have two total solar eclipses in quite rapid uh, uh, succession uh, or uh, a total solar eclipse and an annular eclipse in, in rapid succession. Look at Australia. Look what's happening with Australia between 2021 and 2040. Quite a, quite a lot of 
uh, total solar eclipses. Um, and then you see crisscrossing annular eclipses over South America. Um, so let's just continue here. And you, and you see the, the total solar eclipse on top, annular in the middle, and then the winged uh, pattern below. Uh, now, okay, here we have a map. This is uh, from Xavier Jubia's Neolithic Solar Eclipses database, a map of the June 20th, negative 3088, that is 3089 BC total solar eclipse. Now, there are accuracy issues with these maps when you're going back 5,000 years, but nevertheless, I do believe Xavier Jubia and other people that try to map ancient eclipses do the best they can and try to get it as accurate as they can. There, there can be some shift. Uh, but what's good about the, the ones that go from east to west is even if you shift it a few hundred miles east or west, <clears throat> it's still basically over the same area. The ones that are north and south, that's a bit more problematic. But here it's showing a map of a total solar eclipse above Ireland and England. And this relates to the uh, Boyne Valley Passage tombs, as far as I'm concerned. Nauf, Douth, Newgrange, also Lock Crew. Speaking of Lock Crew, <clears throat> this is a path of the uh, 6th of April, 3233, that solar eclipse. It was a hybrid eclipse. It was total over Ireland and Scotland, Northern England. Um, and it, according to this map, which, you know, can shift a bit east or west. And, uh, and the, and the, so you, it would be total, assuming this is accurate, right between them, could be a little bit left, might have been total over law group, might have been total over the, there might have been even further east or Depictions of solar eclipses in all the past tombs rock art, uh, as far as I'm concerned. What's happening here? I'm trying to forward and it's not going anywhere. Okay. I'm clicking. Can you hear me? I don't know what's happening. It's <laughs> I'm stuck. Okay, here we go. <laughs> it might be my slow computer. Uh, okay. So here, this is Law Crew. This is the Equinox Stone and Carenty of law crew and this is my interpretation of the art uh right in the middle in that yellow light you'll see a, a crude rayed sun symbol so it's a a circle with little lines coming off it and there's a inner circle and and to me this is a very simple we seem to be having communication problems with with robin at the moment please bear with us think are we, we are we okay are we here here i'll i'll, I'll move yes. i'll move forward can you, yeah can you see that yes that's fine okay okay right so i'll go back <laughs> um so crude rates on civil i believe these are flower like uh depictions uh and then you have a solar cross symbol we'll get to the solar cross so moving forward, this is an annular eclipse, non-central, around sunrise or sunset. I don't know who took this photo. Uh, I can't credit it, unfortunately. I, I tried to refine it. And I, I couldn't find it, but you'll see the horn like appearance. Uh, um, and we'll continue on here. Oh, dear. All right, and uh, we seem to be uh, losing you uh, periodically, Robin. Yeah, uh, my, my connection seems to be okay. Okay, here we go. It's okay. Right. So, again, here, sorry about the connection, but my signal is supposed to be good. Um, so, here we have a bull. I believe this is Minoan. And you'll see the bull has a flower on its head. Also, the horns, uh, which are gold-covered. And, and you can see how this compares very nicely with the uh, annular 
Pipes and the uh, total sorry, flower appearance. All right, Robin, um, Robin, can I just stop you there? You're, you're just coming and going all the time. Um, so uh, the first thing I would try, if you close anything you've got open that you don't need, uh, that might help. Right, okay. So we appear to have lost Robin temporarily. Um, apologies, viewers, for this, but as you know, this is all live and this is technology, so these things happen. Robin is joining us from Montreal, so um, so uh, it's a bit of a shame. As soon as we can get Robin back on sound, we will try and uh, move something forward. Can you hear us, Robin? Uh, yeah, I, we're having some connection problems. So again, this is the Egyptian solar bull, um, and a variety of different cultures had their versions of the solar bull. I'll just continue along quickly here. Okay, here we go. We're, now we're at the flower similarity. And what we have here on the left is, again, it's another Wendy Carlos composite image. But what she has done is she has put an X-ray image of the sun in the area where you'd normally see the black circle. And... When you think of this in terms of a flower, people can, can conceptualize, you know, the yellow, orange, red sun surrounded by the white petals of the corona. That, that's an easy thing to conceptualize. Uh, and then over on the right, you have a, a NASA graphic promoting the uh, August 21, 2017 total solar eclipse. And they're drawing it like a flower. You know, it, it's even got yellow petals. So... This is again a very common perception and you have to be you know look look a little further when you see a a flower like symbol uh it might be what's called a rosette uh and it's essentially a solar symbol inspired by the sun uh surrounded by the corona here we have an assyrian one on top i got the same image on the right then on the left this is a tweet that I put out a while ago, and you'll see that the rosette is in, it's, it's representing the sun in a Hittite winged sun symbol, and you'll see the upturned crescent moon. The upturned crescent moon cupping the solar disk is a very, very common sun-moon conjunction symbol, which alludes to solar eclipses. Um, moving along, 31, here we have Mary Cahill. Mary Cahill is an expert on gold she's a former keeper of antiquities at the uh national museum of ireland her expertise is in gold and here's a tweet from not that long ago hard to resist again using this brilliant image from nasa setting it side by side with one of the most expertly made prehistoric gold lunule found near mandreton county Kerry, in the southwest of ireland do i think lunule are ultimately derived from observing solar events yes i do so she's very emphatic about that and on the right we have a curbstone from nauth and you'll notice that the rock carvings are pretty much identical to what you can see during a annular eclipse of the sun and this has been identified as the solar boat by another keeper of irish antiquities uh, Iman P. Kelly, he, he wrote a paper about it, or an article anyway. Um, skipping ahead here, because I do have to get through this. Um, this is a basin that was found in Nauf. Uh, it uh, is lost, so we just have this drawing of it. Uh, and this is how Sir Thomas Molyneux, who I believe discovered it back in the early 1700s, described it. At each end, rude figures expressing, as I take it, the great luminaries of the world, the sun and moon. And I'm more inclined to favor this conjecture because tis sure these two celestial bodies were very rigorously adored by all the northern nations in the time of paganism. Well, obviously, it's a pagan symbol. But I think for sure, I, I don't think there's any reason to doubt that it's the sun and the moon. But it might be a bit more than that because what he identifies as the moon also looks very much like a sun-moon conjunction symbol. 
and the symbol on the left could be a, a simple drawing of a, an annular eclipse. Um, so let's continue along here. Kepri. I already spoke about Kepri. So you have the, the scar of God. And then on the right, you see Kepri. Above and below, it's the sun represented as a rosette. And then above that, you have a, a winged sun symbol. Uh, and it's all basically the same thing. All of this is total solar eclipse uh, symbolism as, as far as I'm concerned. We'll continue along. Here we have a drawing of Kepri. And this is, when I saw this drawing of Kepri in a book, um, when I saw that, I said, wait a minute, that, that's almost identical to some simple drawings of total solar eclipses. It was then that I made the connection. It was with this particular uh, drawing. Um, and then you have the solar boat below it. We'll get to that. You have Horus at the, at the prow of the solar boat. You've got the eye pattern above. Again, you can compare the sun, the, the total eclipse on the black disc to Capri, the body, the wings around Capri to the uh, corona. And then below that, you have Capri, and basically with a, a serpent going all around. So I, I'm quite sure Capri's a, a total solar eclipse god. Here we have upturned crescent moon near a body of water. This is where the solar boat concept comes from, as far as I'm concerned. You can conceive of the upturned crescent of the sun as a boat easily enough, even when it's not close to water. You know, the moon was a ghostly galley and tossed upon cloudy seas. You know, that's from the highwayman. Basically, it's the same idea, but it's the sun instead of the moon. Uh, but here we have a very nice photo of an annular eclipse uh, taken by Elias Chasiotis. Uh, and it's nice that there's a boat. You can see the comparison in size. We'll continue along. Um, this is a sequential photo of the June 10th, 2021 sunrise partial solar eclipse. It was an annual eclipse. It's a photo taken by Michael Zeeler of a Great American Eclipse. And you'll see the boat um, coming up out of the uh, water at the horizon, taking to the sky, as it were. And that little lump there on the horizon, that is a... Uh, a large freighter so you can see how this solar boat is a gigantic boat in terms of perspective so continue along um so this is a tweet i put out to the uh rasc royal astronomical society in canada uh, jamie carter you know pointing this out um we'll continue along quickly because i'm sure we're I'm not sure how much we're doing for time here no you are okay for time don't worry okay <laughs> okay i wasn't sure um uh -huh. So here we have, uh, this is a, a uh, page from a PowerPoint presentation that Mary Cahill, who I mentioned earlier, made during the 1922 National Monument Service Archaeology Lectures. Um, and here again, she says, a solar eclipse is an eclipse that occurs when the moon passes between the sun and earth and the moon fully or partially blocks occults the sun a lunula may symbolically represent both the solar boat and the solar disk in one highly charged object with multiple layers of imagery and meaning and that's one thing to keep in mind mary cahill understands this very clearly these symbols inspired by solar eclipses they can have multiple layers of meaning uh, like those winged sun symbols we saw earlier. You had the standard winged sun symbol, you had Kepri, and then you had the vulture. It's all from the same thing, multiple different interpretations. Um, so we'll continue along. So here we go. Uh, again, yeah, so this is coming back to the solar boat that was identified in Curbstone 86 of Nauf by Iman Pikali. Uh, so he wrote an article about this, I think, in 2019. Um, and so he interpreted these upturned and also downturned crescents as depictions of the solar boat. Uh, but he apparently didn't make the connection to the annular eclipse. So I came along and filled him in about that. Uh, and you can compare the photo by Jia Hao of the May 10th, 2013 annual eclipse to the crescents uh, in the Nauf curbstone. Now, obviously, there's there's no ring there, 
and I can't explain that. Uh, but well, there's one way to easily explain it. It was an off-center eclipse. They didn't see the ring. They only saw the uh, crescents. Uh, but there might be another reason. Anyway, we'll continue along. We're, oh, we're getting towards. We're getting there. <laughs> um, maybe I'm going too fast. Am I going too fast? <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. So here we have the cross-like pattern that's perceivable in the sun's corona during some total solar eclipses. Uh, you even see it in that Truvalo drawing with, with the polar plumes above and below and the wings on either side. You, you have a, a, basically a cross. You have a cross of fanned out polar plumes and then the thicker uh, uh, wing-like uh, condensed streamers in the corona, in, in the equatorial regions. So this is a cross-like pattern in a scientific astronomical drawing of the July 18th 1860 total solar eclipse and over on the right you have something it, eclipse does not look like that it does not <laughs> look like a very squared off cross but you, this is again another point to make is it's it's a question of how the artist perceives things and then draws them so so as you can see here we have a scientific astronomical drawing of a 1715 total solar eclipse so this is going back a while uh, an early very early scientific astronomical drawing and the artist has drawn it in a very uniform way it, no way did the eclipse look like that but that's how they drew it and, and so you have to keep that in mind when uh interpreting symbols and over on the right you have all of these indigenous american symbols um, a lot of them being solar crosses. Um, and then the solar crosses in, in, in many other cultures. Uh, so let's keep going. Okay, here we have another one. On the left, you have a conceptual drawing, uh, Caron Antimidiaire. Uh, and you'll see how the cross-like pattern is formed by four things that are similar to the, the winged pattern in the Truvalo drawing, and they're, they're equally spaced all around. This is a conceptual. This is what a, an astronomer thought an intermediary corona might look like. Uh, so it's not a drawing of an actual eclipse. You do have a drawing of an actual eclipse over on the right. And then between that, you have a Hawaiian a symbol, the cross of Marama, uh, Marama is a, a moon god or goddess, if I remember correctly. And you'll notice how the cross of Marama symbol is pretty much identical to, to this uh, conceptual astronomical drawing. Um, and then below, along the bottom, you have these uh, petroglyphs from uh, Petroglyph National Park in the Albuquerque, New Mexico area. And you'll see how these you know, anthropomorphized disks You'll notice they're black uh, and then surrounded by white, you know, cross-like patterns correspond very nicely to the, uh, yes, 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 Constantine's cross. Yeah, there's that too. Um, in any case, uh, uh, and then you have it on, on the forehead uh, of this uh, Mound Builders Indian. Uh, again, this is very much an overview. You can go into much more detail about all this stuff, um, which I have done. Uh, I'm just going through a, an overview here. So here we have in the middle in black and white, a scientific astronomical drawing of a total solar eclipse cross-like pattern. Again, it didn't look exactly like that, but this is how the artist drawing for the purposes of science drew it. And you'll notice that it's pretty much identical to the Zia cross symbol that's on the Albuquerque and New Mexico flags. That's derived, it's a sun symbol, Zia means sun. And, and you'll see these Zia cross symbols, solar cross symbols, and how they're almost identical to this astronomical drawing of a total solar eclipse. I don't think I have to say much more than that. Uh, oh, yeah, lunar eclipses. We haven't even spoken about them. Um, one meaning of a blood moon is based on its red glow. This blood moon occurs during a total lunar eclipse. Well, we all know that when there's a total lunar eclipse, it, in biblical terms, turns to blood. Um, and from a male perspective, that is 
somewhat apocalyptic. You were talking about wounding, warfare, bloodshed, and so on. Um, however, you might want to think of it from another perspective. Uh, so here we have Super Blood Moon. Your question's answered. This is a NASA page. So they're using the, the Blood Moon terminology to appeal to the masses, I guess, because um, I think it's an a astrological term more than anything else. Um, but anyway, this is the illustration. Uh, it's a web page, NASA web page for the May 26, 2021 super moon eclipse or super blood moon. Uh, so again, you have that term blood moon. Here's a beautiful sequential photo. And again, I, I, I can't credit. I think, I think it may be a Fred Espinac photo but i'm not 100 sure i have to and i couldn't again trace it um i have to be a bit better about figuring out who's what um but in any case here here you see the 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 blood moon a sequential photo um and again that this brings us from a female perspective to the menstrual cycle uh having an as above so below uh correspondence with the menstrual cycle that blood moon can be perceived as metro blood and when i had this thought in my early research is in the mid 1990s i thought well that's very interesting that's a possible perception uh, you know like i basically thought well why have i never heard of a, a myth of the moon menstruating during a total solar eclipse um and i put it aside because i was researching the solar stuff uh but at a certain point some months or even a year or so later I decided to do research into that, and I found quite a bit of stuff. I ended up writing a 26-page essay about all the different uh, cultures that perceived a, a lunar eclipse as the moon goddess, or even moon god, believe it or not, a male moon god menstruating. Uh, but that is a perception. Okay, we're coming to the end here. This is a petroglyph in Nevada at Winnemucca Lake. And I've known about this petroglyph for quite some time, and I interpret it as a typical uh, raid sun symbol inspired by total solar eclipses, most probably. You cannot, can't be 100% sure. Um, but I only recently learned that this petroglyph and, and other petroglyphs associated with it were dated from 10 millennia to 15 millennia ago. So wow. if, if this is indeed a prehistoric depiction of a total solar eclipse, and I have every reason to believe it is, it shows that the influence of, of seeing that eye-like pattern, that flower-like pattern uh, during a total solar eclipse goes back to at least 10 millennia, maybe even 15 millennia. Uh, we have to keep in mind that, you know, even if this wasn't recorded in stone or whatever, that total solar eclipses have been with us for as long as we've been around you know for as long as homo sapiens or even neanderthals have existed these patterns have been perceivable in the sky and and whether or not they were recorded in stone i think they had an influence on beliefs and, and culture um and that's it for now i i, I mean there's all a lot more i can say uh, I can go into a lot more detail, but but we're supposed to keep this to 45 minutes. Um, so that's my final slide. I do have a little credit thing here um, for more information. So I have two Eclipseology blogs. I lost the password to the first one. I haven't been able to modify it. I haven't been able to recover the password. So there's the eclipseology.blogspot.com. That, that basically what happened is I had websites from about 1998 until 2006 when they went down i had some financial difficulties and i couldn't pay the bill and all my websites went down and then i sort of revived things by starting a a, a, a blog spot blog uh, and linking to uh internet archive versions of the uh web pages and then more recently i started a cultural eclipsology blog which i will be keeping up with uh, i also have an eclipsology facebook group uh, so you just look, you know, just type in Eclipseology after Facebook.com. If you search for the Eclipseology hashtag on Twitter and Facebook, you'll find it. Uh, and if you're interested in particular things, you know, such as the solar cross and so on, just search for the Eclipseology hashtag and other appropriate keywords. So 
I guess we can open it up for questions uh, if anyone has questions. Okay, right. Well, listen. Uh, thank you so much, Robin. That was uh, that was you know incredibly interesting. It's generated a lot of conversation uh, in the chat. So perhaps I can show throw some of these uh, at you. Um, where do we go? So Steve, um, happy well. Steve says this is fascinating. Has Robin done a book? <laughs> well, yes and no. Um, basically, the book's online. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, getting published by a mainstream publisher has never been easy. Um, and self-publishing can be quite costly. Yeah. And I'm not a big fan of Amazon. The, the exploitative business practices of Amazon don't turn me on. Uh, no. Plus there's rights issues, you know, like it's all right to do something, you know, in a presentation like this. Uh, but if I was to do a proper book, it would be necessary to, you know, contact all these photographers and get the rights to, you know, have the photos yeah, published in the book sure. and, you know, shell out some money and so on and so forth. So, no, I do not have a book. But the equivalent of the book is online. Uh, you just have to Thank you look so around. much. Um, Thank you. Know, you. Go, going back to my original websites that were up between 1998 and 2006, they were all linked together. They, they were all quite detailed. Basically, even the equivalent of two or three books online. But Right. Okay. If you like to um, message me those links that you had up at the end of the presentation, I will put them in the description of the video so people can click on them uh, or go to them directly. Um, so, so there we are. Um, Ian says uh, when, when you were talking about the correlation between you know the the image of the eclipse and uh, and the art, there's an obvious correlation. Wonderful. Um, so. Um, what else have we got here? When you were talking about the curbstones, um, Bob wrote uh, this, rolls stone of dust dung across face of sun or the tomb, bull of heaven. Uh, I don't know whether that, that uh, means anything to you. Well, the bull of heaven is, is obviously referring to the concept of the bull of heaven, basically the solar bull. Yeah. Uh, you could also have the, a lunar bull because you still have the horns, but those horns that you see during an annual eclipse are quite spectacular they're very much like uh yeah the gold horns and particularly the gold horns of a you know bull god as it were um but yeah the, the correlations yeah it's very obvious I, I hope i'm not talking too loud but um, no no you're fine okay uh these correlations they, they actually are very obvious um uh, and so for me it's it's i don't use a lot of maybe or you know, what if, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, I use terms like probably, most probably, almost certainly for most of the stuff. Mm. Some things you can go out on a limb on. Some of it is not as clear, uh, and, and it's possible to go out on some pretty long limbs there. Uh, but the central stuff, which I went through today, it, I think it is pretty obvious and is pretty solid. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Bob says uh, volcanic eruptions would affect an eclipse. How would it give it greater visibility of the the wings? Well, I suppose I would, were... I would expect a volcanic eruption to obscure. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but, I mean, no, no I, I don't think a volcanic eruption would be very helpful. No. Um, um, can I just show? And, and the wing. Let, let's be very, very clear. The wing that is the sun's corona, so it's got nothing yeah. to do. With an eclipse, uh, with a, a volcanic eruption. The yeah. If I can just stick this slide up, Robin. Uh, yeah. Corona. This is the corona using right. a coronagraph. Right. So that's why we can only ever see the sun, uh, the the sun's corona, <clears throat> when the uh, we have a total eclipse. I mean, they've they've reinstated the sun in this picture, mm -hmm. um, but as you can see, you can see all the streamers coming off. Mm. And uh, usually you tend to get, if I remember rightly, you tend to get the perfect wings when you're near solar maximum, I think it is. Maximum? That's interesting because I, I, mm. Maunder had it the other way around. Maunder, oh, yeah, it probably was. Like I said, I, I wasn't sure where I was yeah. quoting that right. Strangely so. enough, the, the 1991 eclipse where the bird-like pattern is very obvious, I don't think it was a minimum. I think it was getting closer to to maximum yeah, um the, the but, solar wind structure is uh more equally dispersed around the sun during solar maximum and exactly more yeah yeah confined yeah, to a plane yeah, during solar minimum. yeah mm. yeah that's normally yeah. the case yeah okay moving on uh ian says great 
Um, he's going to watch it uh, when it's published on the channel afterwards. Uh, Steve says, fabulous. Thanks, Robin. And he also asks, uh, what was the date of that second eclipse across Nauth and Douth again? Uh, the remember. second one. Uh, oh, he means the, the, well, there's the 3088, the negative 3088. So 3089 BC, mm -hmm. that's a later one. That's That would have been after uh, Douth had been built according to the standard uh, dating. Mm -hmm. the, these passage tombs, are believed to have been built between 3200 BCE and 3000 BCE. Uh, and there can be a bit of variance there, uh, but they can also be older because some of them use uh, recycled material. So I, I believe they, they could be somewhat older, going back to 3500 BCE. Uh, but anyway, that's only two. I uh, Using um, Xavier Jubier's Neolithic uh, Solar Eclipse database, and, and, and looking at different parts of Ireland, you know, I, I found seven, seven what? total solar eclipses above Ireland during the fourth millennium BCE, which corresponds nicely with the stone of the seven zones. I don't, seven zones. I didn't mention it, but that petroglyph at Douf, it's one of seven, one of what? seven on the same stone. And when I, when I first saw that, that it was seven raid sun symbols on this stone, um, which was somewhat later than seeing the individual ones, so maybe even a year or two later, when I became aware of that, uh, it occurred to me that, well, maybe this is a commemoration of, of several or even fully seven total solar eclipses spread over some time. Uh, it, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, really interesting. Uh, Sandra, hi, Sandra. I hope you're well. Hope to catch up with you in Ireland when I uh, hope to come over sometime this year so hope we can catch up. Uh, thank you, Robin. Fascinating talk, which I learned a lot from. Uh, Derek says, thanks, Robin. Um, and uh, Gerard says, uh, thank you, Robin. Fascinating stuff. Enough material for many volumes. <laughs> and Steve, again, says, uh, can you clarify Xavier's surname? Yes, it's Jubier. It's J-U-B-I-E-R. Uh, and it's it's written. You know, if you if you look at the presentation, it's it's right there. It's it's it's, mm. it's fantastic. Written. There's another one here from Steve, which I'll just pop up. Um, it's more of a remark on a Truvillet. Truvillet. Yeah, he mm -hmm. says no dispute in the eclipse premises, but Truvillet, uh, Truvillo, sorry, did some weird and mysterious things in his art representations. Meteors sharply change in direction and a bump in Saturn's rings. <laughs> so, uh, thanks for that, that Steve. Fair yeah. enough. Fair yeah. enough. But I will say that that drawing. It actually is quite accurate. Like, regardless how inaccurate some of the other stuff might have been, that mm. drawing of the 1878 total solar eclipse is quite accurate. Again, you know the the the, the polar plumes are very well defined. They don't really look exactly like that. Mm. Um, the wings are very very dense, uh, but nevertheless, in, in terms of a 19th century astronomical drawing of a total solar eclipse, that is one of the most accurate. Uh, and it certainly corresponds well with the symbolism, the winged sun symbolism of Assyria, other Mesopotamian uh, cultures, you know, Sumeria and so on. If you look at especially the Mesopotamian and Assyrian winged sun symbols, you'll see the correspondence very clearly. Yeah, and yeah. Steve says uh, absolutely his representations were very good. So, um, So there we are. Okay, so there we are. Well, thank you so much again, Robin. We can't thank you enough. That was a, a really fascinating presentation. And obviously, we hope that if you uh, if you do any more research and you'd like to come back and 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 uh, do another presentation in the future, you you are more than welcome. Uh, I'll put so it this way. First of all, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it very very much. This is the first time I've done anything like this. First time I've put together a. PowerPoint presentation period. <laughs> it's not rehearsed, by the way. It's very off the cuff. You did very, well well. very well from uh, that. But as, yeah. as far as it goes, as, as far as that invitation goes, what I can offer, if you wish, is going into more detail about different perceptions: the solar boat, the winged sun, the 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 eye similar. I haven't even. I don't think I even mentioned the Nazca lines. <laughs> the oh, Nazca no, lines right. are these that's gigantic right. geoglyphs in Peru. Uh, yeah. And they're made to re, uh, be seen by a gigantic eye up in the sky. Well, I shouldn't say gigantic. They're made to be seen by an eye in the sky. Um, yeah. and, and you have all these ancient aliens uh, 
Von Daniken crap. Excuse my language, but um, <laughs> you carry um, on. <laughs> um, when when I when I realized that the total eclipse sun looks like an eye, pupil and iris, I thought, oh, I wonder if the Nazca lines were made to respond to that. And I used uh, Theodore von Oppolzer's canon of eclipses yes. to find that, well, what do you know? There was, there was a series of total solar eclipses above southern Peru right around the time that the Nazca lines were made. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, the Nazca lines are a response to seeing not just the eye, but also the bird, because many of the Nazca lines are bird patterns. I was yeah. informed by Phyllis Pitluga, who's an expert on the Nazca lines, that all of the birds are aligned with the winter solstice. And wow. I don't think I mentioned it in the presentation yet, because uh, there's so many things. But what happens is ancient cultures, because total solar eclipses don't happen you know, every year, or every decade, or every century, but maybe two or three happen in bang, 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 what do they do? How do they commemorate that? How do they, they, they mm. transpose the death and rebirth of the sun idea onto the next best thing, which mm. is the annual death and rebirth of the sun in the winter solstice sunset and sunrise, which is easily predictable. Fantastic. Really, well, yes, we, we, I think we would love you to come back and, and talk about things in a bit more detail. Give you some more practice with PowerPoint anyway. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you know, you're, you're welcome. And uh, as Steve says, uh, wow, this just gets better and better. So uh, I think you've got a bit of a fan club going on here, Robin. So uh, we yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear more about the lines, definitely. Yeah. 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 Well, definitely. I do have a web page. Oops. Oh, Oops. You'll, you'll find my stuff, um, especially if you put my name in it, okay. Rob and Edgar, Nazca Lines Eclipses. Yeah. You'll find yeah. extensive Thanks. writing about it. Yes. Well, we will. We will definitely uh, ask you back at some point, Robin. Um, so uh, you know, put your put your presentation together, and let us know when it's done, and uh, we can get you back. <laughs> right. So, Great. If, if you would like to, of course. So, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. definitely want to share this information with people. So. Yeah. And uh, and Ian says the gift that keeps giving. So, mm. so there we are. So, just a quick one, mm. Andy. This has just popped up. Um, uh, Bob LeBlanc, crystal gazing, as used for sun's navigation during a cloudy day. Could crystals afford greater winged visibility? Neat stuff, old tools. Because um, if you remember, the um, the Vikings were renowned for using crystals mm -hmm. on um, uh, cloudy days to be able mm -hmm. to navigate because mm -hmm. they could would look through them and uh, they, mm -hmm. they could still see the sun through the... Uh, the cloud, not not brilliantly, but right, right. Maybe they can really tell where it was, was, which is the yeah. important thing. Yeah, honestly, uh, I, I think anything between your eyes and uh, total solar eclipse um, isn't going to help. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. to see what's there. Uh, uh, when it comes to totality, again. when it comes to totality, I think just naked eye viewing yeah. uh, is the best. I think a crystal in between your eye. And mm. a total solar eclipse, it, not only would it not be helpful, but it would be mm. yeah, probably yeah, definitely, you know, definitely naked eye is the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, never look at the sun without proper protection. Yeah, yeah. we must remind mm. people Absolutely. of that. Steve, mm. <laughs> yeah, Steve says I'm researching Neolithic constructions on Anglesey, just across the water from now. So, um, mm. so oh, well, you notice the eclipse track uh, that you know, like a lot of these eclipses that went over Ireland went over Stonehenge and. Yeah, and, others. Yeah. and actually, the Orkneys. If you look at the Orkneys, uh, yeah, mm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Once, once you're once you're onto this stuff, you'll you'll find it all over the place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, then. Well, we'd like to be a, a, a big thank you to to Robin. Um, mm. Let's now uh, move on, um, just very quickly, because time is getting against us here. I just wanted to share one image. Um, Graham Turvey was trying to link to this image earlier, but of course links are, are blocked for security mm -hmm. reasons. The um, Ingenuity, ro uh, Ingenuity helicopter on Mars, as you may have seen in the news, has made its last flight because um, during its last and 72nd flight, as it descended, it looks like what happened was that its rotors hit the ground and got damaged so unfortunately we've had to say goodbye to that amazing little helicopter on mars don't forget flying in 100th the thickness of earth's atmosphere and it's proved that we can fly aerial vehicles on mars 
And um, the reason why the rotors hit the ground, they think, was because it was flying over a pretty featureless terrain and its navigation system found it difficult to establish exactly how high up it was and, uh, and, and what it was doing. The Perseverance Rosa has caught up with Ingenuity and taken what will probably be the last ever image of the uh, helicopter. Um, and you can see it here sitting on the side of a, a sand dune. You can see how featureless that, that terrain is and not surprised yeah. that Ingenuity got how? got confused. So so this is the last image that we'll ever see of Ingenuity. And, um, and we're all very sad about that because it was only meant to last. They thought if they got five flights out of it before it failed, they'd be lucky. And it did 72 in the end. Which just goes to show yet again the uh, the NASA and JPL engineering is absolutely unbelievable, and it's achieved a lot. The helicopter um, it's been acting as a reconnaissance vehicle for Perseverance to make sure that Perseverance uh, didn't uh, go into any terrain which might have uh, which might have ended its mission. Uh, don't forget that um, the Curiosity rover uh, ended its mission by getting bogged down in sand dunes, unfortunately. Um, and uh, it's as I said, it's just proved that we can do reconnaissance on Mars with aerial vehicles, and um, and there we are. So uh, RIP Ingenuity, you did a great job, and uh, and I'm sure that in the future, uh, you know, we'll be flying more vehicles like this uh, on Mars. Mm -hmm. So there we are. And I think uh, now as time's getting against us, we'll draw things to a close to this evening. We'd like to say yeah. very special thanks again to Robin for being with us and delivering this fascinating thanks, presentation. So thank you, Robin. The uh, customary round of applause, please, for Robin. Yeah. <laughs> and um, can and I, also... Can I just uh, remind everyone that, that there will be a total solar eclipse from Mexico through the United States up through Canada on April 8th, just yeah. over two months from now. That's right. So if you're That's in... Right. North America, you might want to make your way to the path of totality. Yeah. And even if you're not in North America. Um, yeah. Lou's our roving reporter for that one. Yeah, Lou, Lou's going <laughs> to deliver our report. Um, so uh, so that would be great. So, you know, I'm sure everybody's looking forward uh, to that. Just a really advanced warning again that here in Spain, we have a total eclipse of the sun in August 2026. And that will be visible. The line of totality goes through the city of Valencia, which is where I'll be, because that's only three hours away by train. So I'll definitely be there for that. There's another total eclipse of the sun the following year visible from Spain. So if Spain gets eclipses two years running. That one will be visible from the very tip of southern Spain, sort of Cadiz and, and Gibraltar, uh, that sort of area. Um, and I hope to be there for that as well. But uh, anyway, so... From, from us all at Space Odyssey, thank you, the viewers especially, and mostly for, for, for being with us. And uh, thank you for your interest in what Robin's been presenting. We've had some good questions. So um, I think there's been a bit of interest about this. We'd also like to say thank you, of, of course, to uh, Dr. Frank Prendergast for uh, um, doing his presentation about uh, uh, Neolithic monuments in Ireland a couple of weeks ago, which was, uh, which was fantastic. So if you'd like to see more of this content on Space Oddities, uh, just uh, put it in the comments of the video or drop us a line at spaceodditieslive at gmail.com, spaceodditieslive at gmail.com. Mm. And uh, if you'd like to see anything in particular on Space Oddities that you think we haven't covered or ought to be covering, just send us an email. We're always open to suggestions uh, because you are our audience and we love you. So there we are. Next week on Space Oddities, we're going to have uh, we're going to have Keith Mosley talking about the science of astrometry, which, as you may know, is measuring the positions of stars. And uh, Keith has put together a couple of presentations about this. Fascinating stuff again. We do hope you can join us. And he'll be delivering the first of those next week here on Space Oddities at the same time, 8 p.m. UK or 3 p.m. Uh, EST. I'd like to thank the panel for being here. I'd like to thank Daz and Roger and Michael and Andy and Lou for being here as always. And uh, Lou, I hope it gets a bit warmer for you. Oh, uh, I do too. I'm, I'm just so anxious to get, get those outstanding astro images up there for Roger to post. I'm so <laughs> <happy>. <laughs> <laughs> yes. the, the We'll cool. see. Oh. Yeah. Uh, you know, no viewers that um, there's going to be a bit of a competition going on between Lou and Roger for uh, yeah. astro yeah. images. So, what do you uh, mean? We'll see stars. You mean? 
<laughs> uh, David and Goliath. <laughs> okay. All right, then, viewers. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Have a fantastic week. Take care of each other and uh, be good. And if you can't be good, be average. So we will see you next week here again on Space Holidays. In the meantime, you might like to know that um, I posted a compilation of some of our Astronomy Basics videos that we've done on the channel, which has been running in a loop uh, this week. But um, it's, about, uh, it's about two hours of, of uh, astronomy videos that we've done uh, showing you some of the basics and some other stuff as well. And we hope you enjoyed watching that. We'll be putting more up soon. And, and that's about it. So from all of us here at Space Oddities, take care of yourselves and uh, we will see.